In fact, it turns out that the sodium ions, which we haven't considered so far, are very important. If we now consider the situation for sodium in our cell, it turns out that sodium has a higher concentration in the extracellular fluid. So sodium is more concentrated outside the cell than inside. So if we think about the sodium, there's a concentration-based force for sodium into the cell. It wants to come in. But I've told you that the membrane has a resting membrane potential in a nerve cell of minus 70 millivolts. The inside is negative. So if you think about it from an electrical point of view, sodium from an electrical point of view also wants to enter the cell. So the two forces acting on the sodium ions are both acting in the same direction. From a concentration point of view, it wants to be inside the cell. From an electrical point of view, it wants to be inside the cell as well. Now if the two forces are in the same direction, that means that sodium is not at equilibrium. There's a very big combined driving force driving it into our cell. And it turns out that for pretty much all animal cells, that's going to be the case. There's a large driving force for sodium driving it into the cell, resulting from the combined concentration and electrical forces. Now that driving force is called the electrochemical gradient for sodium. Electrochemical, the word includes electro, referring to the electrical force, and chemical, referring to the concentration force. This is the combined force driving the sodium into the cell. It really wants to come in. But under normal circumstances, it can't really get in very easily. And the reason is that, although as I was saying earlier, the membrane is very permeable to potassium at rest, there are quite a few potassium channels in the membrane which are open and allow potassium through, there are relatively few sodium channels in the membrane. So sodium finds it quite difficult to get into the cell. There's a big driving force, but it can't get in very easily. So as a result, it normally only trickles through at a very slow rate into the cell. Now this situation, in a way, is analogous to a hydroelectric dam. If you imagine up in the mountains, imagine a large lake or reservoir which has a big dam, a big concrete dam, and so the water is built up to quite a high level behind the dam. Now, what the dam is used for, ultimately, is to produce energy. And the way it does that is that there's a turbine within the dam, and if you turn the tap on, as it were, the water is allowed to flow through the turbine, it goes down the rest of the mountain, but in flowing through the turbine and drives the turbine and generates electricity, uh, and everybody's happy by that. So the way this works is that you've got a large store of what's called potential energy, and that's the water. There's a big driving force for the water to move out of the dam down the mountain. So there's a really large driving force on it, a large store of potential energy, and your turbine can tap into that store. Energy is released when the water is allowed through the turbine, and the released energy, the so-called free energy, can be used to generate electrical power, which is what we want the dam to do. Now that situation is quite similar to the situation I've just described in a nerve cell, or indeed any cell in the body. The large driving force for sodium to enter the cell, the large electrochemical gradient as we call it, is like the large store of potential energy in our hydroelectric dam. And if you allow sodium to enter the cell, it releases some of that free energy which can be used to do something useful. Now, we're not using it in a real cell to generate electricity like a hydroelectric dam does, but the free energy that's released if you allow sodium into the cell can be used to do other useful biological processes. The most universal process that can be powered in this way is called secondary active transport. Within the cell membrane, let's imagine that we have a little transporter, and this transport protein allows sodium into the cell, and that would cause energy to be released. Now, what we could do is we could use that transporter simultaneously to pump another substance into the cell at the same time. And let's imagine that's glucose. 
So we now have a protein which allows sodium and glucose into a cell. Now it turns out that these transporters exist. We find them, for example, in the small intestine, and they're referred to as SGLT transporters, sodium glucose transporters. Now what's the point of these things? Well, as the sodium enters the cell, it releases free energy. And the protein can rather cleverly harness the energy that's released to pull glucose into the cell as well. The point being that you would use such a transporter if glucose didn't want to enter the cell normally. So in other words, if the concentration gradient for glucose was actually in the opposite direction, glucose, if anything, would want to leave the cell. But in order to draw the glucose in, you need to put in energy to drive it against its gradient. And that's why we have this secondary active transporter. So the energy released as sodium goes downhill is used to pull glucose uphill. The two processes are coupled. So our cell now is tapping into this big store of potential energy, this electrochemical gradient for sodium. And there are lots of different types of secondary active transporters in all cells of your body. They all have the common feature of allowing sodium in, which releases the energy which powers the process. And then at the same time, the transporter will do something else useful, like, for example, pulling glucose in, or it could be pushing another molecule out of the cell. You can use a secondary active transporter as what's called an antiporter to move another ion in the opposite direction to the sodium. Secondary active transport is a very, very important process, and it relies on this electrochemical gradient to sodium. Now, there is, of course, a problem with this scenario. If you imagine your hydroelectric dam, yes, you can allow some water out of it, you can generate electricity, but eventually the dam, the reservoir, will run empty. The water will all be gone, and at that point, you can't achieve anything useful. From a cell's point of view, that would effectively be the cell dying. That would be the end of your cell. So the hydroelectric dam company needs a way of topping up the water levels in the dam so you can continue to generate your electricity. In the same way, a real cell needs a way of maintaining the electrochemical gradient for sodium. In other words, if sodium is moving into the cell through these secondary active transporters all the time, eventually the sodium will build up inside the cell to such a point that there will no longer be an electrochemical gradient. That means there's no more energy released if the sodium were to enter, and you couldn't power your secondary active transport processes anymore. That would be game over. So if the sodium is coming into the cell through these transporters, you need a way to get rid of it. And that's why we have what's called the sodium pump, otherwise known as the sodium-potassium ATPase. Now this is a very important molecule. This molecule is known as a primary active transporter. And a primary active transporter uses energy directly to achieve its goal. It's not tapping into an electrochemical gradient, it's using energy directly from the hydrolysis of ATP. And that's why it's called a sodium-potassium ATPase. The ATPase means that it breaks down ATP. Now these pumps are found in every cell of the body, and they use ATP energy to achieve what they need to achieve. And in fact, the use of energy by the sodium pumps around the body represents a large fraction of the ATP that we require to survive every day. So it's a costly process, but it's absolutely necessary. What these pumps do is they push sodium back out of the cell again. Now that's against its electrochemical gradient, and that's why you need the ATP energy to be used to achieve that. So you're pumping the sodium out at the cost of ATP, maintaining the gradient for sodium, and topping up your electrochemical gradient, if you like, topping up your dam so you can allow the process to continue, always, for the life of the cell. It turns out that these sodium pumps also allow potassium into the cell. They pump potassium into the cell, in fact, because that process is also against the electrochemical gradient for potassium in this case. So they're using energy to pump sodium out and pump potassium in. And it turns out that they do this in the ratio 3 to 2. So three sodiums are removed from the cell for every two potassiums that come back in.
The process is costly, but it maintains the gradient for sodium. The secondary active transporters can then tap into that gradient and they can do all of the transport processes that are required. So sodium is sometimes referred to as the common currency of these animal cells. You pay for the gradient using ATP with your sodium pump, and then you tap into the gradient, you cash in, if you like, with all of your different transporters, uh, and they use the energy to run their various processes. It's a sodium economy, and that's how animal cells tend to work.